Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Sea Otter Science Symposium. My name is Chanel Hasten. I am the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. We are super thrilled uh, to have you join us this year. We have some incredible speakers, um, so I will get straight to it. Oops. Here we go. So if you're not familiar, uh, the Alaka Alliance is a nonprofit based in Oregon working to return sea otters back to the Oregon coast. Uh, we haven't had them in over 112 years. Unfortunately, they were hunted for their very, very dense fur. Um, so if you want to learn more about us, uh, you can jump on our website, OregonSeaOtters.org. Um, or follow us on social media at Alaka Alliance on Instagram and at Alaka A on Twitter. Um, and just wanted to go over some symposium etiquette before we get started. Your attendee webcam and microphone should be off and muted for the entirety of the symposium. Um, presentation start times will remain as scheduled. Um, so even if a presenter ends early, we will keep those hard start times just because people will be tuning in and out for each presentation. Um, so use the Zoom Q&A feature, please, to post any of your questions for our presenters today. They will answer as many as they can after their presentation, um, time permitting, obviously. And please be respectful using the public chat box. Um, we'll be sharing links and relevant information throughout the presentation in that chat box. Um, I'll also be randomly choosing uh, any attendees for each presentation at the end for some fun prizes. I've got these really great sea otter salt tins from Jacobson Salt Company that gets uh, salt from the Oregon coast. And I've got a couple near beer fest cups that uh, we have for our otter beer um, challenge that we do each year. So one of you might, uh, or six of you might win some great things today. Uh, okay, and uh, thanks for joining us. We are very excited to have you here and we hope you learn some new and exciting information about sea otters, kelp forests, and all of the above. I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, the wonderful Bob Bailey, who is the board president here for the Alaka Alliance to introduce our speakers today. Great, thank you, Chanel. <clears throat> I'm, I too am really uh, excited to be here today. Uh, we look forward to this every year. So uh, first, first presentation, our keynote, uh, sea otter genomes from Japan to Baja, California, aquatic adaptation, fur trade devastation, and lost populations. As we know, sea otters are one of the most recently evolved marine mammals. They once occupied the nearshore ocean of the Pacific Rim from Japan to Mexico. Their dense fur enabled them to keep warm in these frigid waters, but as we know, that remarkable adaptation became a highly valued commodity, which nearly led to their extinction during the maritime fur trade in the 18th and 19th centuries a demise that has had consequential effects on coastal kelp forest ecosystems across this entire region. Thanks to con concerted conservation efforts, though, sea otter populations have rebounded across parts of this original range, but they are still missing in many places where they once thrived, including an 800-mile stretch of coastline between the southern sea otter population in California and the northern sea otters in Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. Dr. Annabelle Beigman is a postdoc student at the Harris Lab at the University of Washington Genome Sciences. Um, she earned her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, that would be UCLA, go Bruins, in 2020, and graduated summa cum laude from Harvard University in 2012. So she's here today to tell us how today's genetic analysis uh, can detect signals of sea otter evolution in the marine realm, as well as the genetic scars on the population as a result of the fur trade. Annabelle, it's all yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that intro. Um, it looks like I can't start my video, Chanel. I'm not sure if that's uh, okay or not, but I can at least just share my presentation, hopefully. Um, all right. That look okay? It looks wonderful. <laughs> 
Fantastic. All right. Um, you should be able to start your video. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to have to stop screen sharing for a minute to do that. It says the host has stopped it. What? How dare they? Hold <laughs> on. This is the fun technical things we do. Um, let me, let's see. There we go. Okay. Try now. There we go. All right. All right. Sorry Thanks about that. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. All right. Let me get my talk back up here. Awesome. Okay. So um, thank you so much for that really kind introduction, Bob. I'm thrilled to be here speaking to all of you. Um, before we get started, I first just want to um, acknowledge the, the long and interconnected history between sea otters and indigenous peoples. And there's a wonderful page on the Alaka Alliance website that um, sort of shows some of this history and you can watch a video and hear indigenous perspectives about sea otters. So I really recommend checking that out. And I think this history is really beautifully illustrated in this diagram from the Alaka Alliance where it shows all the different words for sea otter in the languages of the Oregon coast. And of course, this is a history, not just in Oregon, but all the way out to Japan with the Ainu people and around the Northern Pacific Rim. So um, I'm really appreciative to the Alaka Alliance for, for bringing us all together and for um, doing such a good job to preserve this history. So thank you all uh, for that. Okay, so yeah, just a bit about me. Bob uh, really wonderfully told you most of this already about my sort of educational history. Here I am now coming to you as a researcher in Seattle. It's very rainy today. Um, and I've enjoyed and carried out a lot of different aspects of biological research. You can see me here out in the field collecting whale poop samples or in the lab extracting DNA. Um, but most of my time these days is spent um, on the computer doing computational genetic analyses of sea otters and other species uh, population history. And so that's what I'll be talking about the most uh, today. Okay. So to give you a little roadmap for our talk today, um, I'll first be giving you some background on sea otter evolution and the impacts of the fur trade on sea otter populations. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about genomes, why we sequence them and what we hope to learn from them. And then take you through some of my own findings based on my research on sea otter genomics and what we can learn about the history of sea otters. And we'll wrap up and hopefully have some time because uh, I'd love to hear some of your questions and, and have a discussion with you. All right, so let's dive right in. So sea otters evolved recently and rapidly to the marine environment. When I say recently, I mean in terms of evolutionary time. Uh, other marine mammal lineages like manatees or whales or seals all entered the marine realm. Their ancestors entered the marine realm some 30 to 55 million years ago. So they've had a lot of time to become really well adapted to this environment. Sea otters ancestors only entered the marine realm less than 5 million years ago, maybe as recently as about 1 million years ago, which of course to us seems like a really long time, but actually in this sort of big evolutionary scale is really a snap of the fingers. And so the fact that they have yet still been able to evolve to really thrive in this very harsh environment is quite remarkable. Uh, some of you may be scuba divers, you will know that it's pretty hard to be a mammal underwater. Um, when we do it, we need to take a lot of gear with us to be able to survive on a dive underwater. We need to bring extra air with us so we can breathe. We need some way to propel ourselves through the water with fins or paddles. We need some form of ballast for buoyancy control, right? Because that extra air is going to make us kind of buoyant and make us bob to the surface unless we have a weight belt or some other way to weigh ourselves down so we can get to the bottom. And most importantly, we need some form of temperature insulation because you're just going to be bleeding body heat out into the water unless you have some way to stay warm. Sea otters do not need to stop at their local dive locker. They have actually evolved all these characteristics themselves. Um, they have expanded lungs that let them take their extra air. They have paddle like feet and tail that propel them really efficiently through the water. They have really dense limb bones that act as their ballast, like the diver's weight belt. Here you can see scans of a ferret bone that's a, a terrestrial relative of sea otters, a giant otter, which is a freshwater relative, and then a sea otter, 
And what you can see is the sea otter bone is sort of shorter and thicker and much more highly mineralized on the inside. So these are very dense, heavy bones that let them get down to, to the bottom when they're on their dives. But perhaps most remarkably, as Bob mentioned, is the sea otter fur. This is their form of temperature insulation, and it's a really different strategy than some of those other marine mammals that I was talking to you about, like seals or whales. Those marine mammals have a thick layer of fat called blubber that keeps them warm in the water. Sea otters don't have that layer of fat. They really have to rely on this incredible fur. It's made up of interlocking hairs that trap bubbles of air, and it's the densest of any mammals. And so it's an incredible adaptation that they've made in this relatively short time uh, to adapt to the marine environment. Unfortunately for sea otters, humans noticed that this is a really great way to stay warm and dry. And so this incredible adaptation that they have evolved nearly also led to the species extinction at the hands of the maritime fur trade. So sea otters used to be highly abundant everywhere you see the hatched lines on this uh, plot. We're talking tens of thousands of otters in these areas with the hatched lines. Um, but then once the maritime fur trade began, they started being systematically wiped out from all this area around their entire uh, global range. And um, they only managed to survive here where I'm highlighting some blue boxes in tiny numbers of remnant colonies. So we're thinking like going down from 10,000 otters in an area to probably fewer than 100 in most of these uh, regions. So just tiny little surviving groups. And they were totally wiped off the map in large swaths of the coastline, as you can see, where there's just unbroken red X's. In California, it was thought at first that they had been driven fully extinct, but there was a small coterie of survivors that were found later in the 30s on a really inaccessible bit of coastline near Big Sur. And this is actually a photo from that time period of that surviving remnant colony. And all sea otters that are in California today are descendants of this tiny group of survivors. Sea otters are a keystone species. This is you know, one of the big themes of the symposium today is the interconnectedness of these coastal ecosystems. Um, sea otters eat urchins, which can mow down kelp. And so if you take otters out of this equation, there's nothing to stop the sea urchins from just completely decimating kelp forests. And kelp forests are an incredibly wonderful ecosystem that provide habitat for fish and other marine mammals. They carry out carbon capture and nutrient exchange. And if you don't have sea otters, they can just get wiped out. So they're not just important to preserve sea otters for their own sake, but also for the health of coastal ecosystems. So in 1911, conservation efforts began, uh, starting with some international cooperation uh, with what was called the Fur Seal Treaty. And this stopped sea otters being hunted for fur with exceptions made for indigenous Aleut and Ainu traditional hunts. The protections for sea otters were strengthened in the 70s through the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act to further protect the species. And there was long-term monitoring and scientific research, um, including on sea otters' ecosystem impacts, their population growth, their health, their genetics, to try to understand and preserve sea otters going forward. So I really think of sea otters as an ongoing conservation success because in many of the locations where they were nearly wiped out, they've really started to rebound and in some regions are back up to tens of thousands of otters. So that's a really um, amazing success from the absolute brink of extinction to now uh, a high abundance. In California, um, they're still starting to rebound, but it is slower than in some of these other regions, but they're still back up to about 3000 otters, again, all descended from that one tiny group. Um, but we have to remain vigilant. There are a lot of threats still out there for sea otters. Um, so there can be issues with a lack of food or a lack of habitat availability. They can be in too dense clusters to really thrive. Um, predation by sharks and orcas are, is a huge problem. Oil spills, disease spillover from land, and a lot more. So while I say this is an ongoing success, it's because we need to stay vigilant, stay managing these populations to make sure they continue to rebound and thrive. But the great thing is that as sea otters start to come back, you can have this transformation back from these urchin barrens caused by the absence of sea otters back to these lush and beautiful kelp forests. So why do I study sea otter genomics? Why did I spend so many years trying to untangle their DNA? Uh, well, for one thing, the fact that there's such a recent evolutionary transition to the marine realm 
is quite unique and remarkable, and I wanted to know if I could detect any genomic signals of that recent adaptation. Uh, in the sea otter genome and try to understand what genes could maybe be underlying this transition to the marine realm. They also represent sort of a tragic natural experiment, the way the fur trade hit all these sea otter populations in parallel across their entire range simultaneously, um, lets us actually really explore the consequences of such an event genetically and see if there's any genetic signals of that event left in sea otters that are alive today that are the descendants of those that survived the fur trade. Finally, as I mentioned, they are this keystone species. Their survival is critical to nearshore ecosystem health. So we wanted to understand if they're at risk from genetic factors in the future and whether genetics could be used to aid in any management decisions. So now that we know everything about sea otters, I wanna spend a bit of time telling you about genomes. Uh, genomes are the blueprints of life. Uh, in every one of the cells in your body, inside the cell nucleus is a big tangle of spaghetti, uh, that's your DNA. Uh, in humans, uh, your genome is arranged into 23 pairs of chromosomes, and this contains all the instructions for what it means to be a human, or in the case of a sea otter, to be a sea otter. This is just a tiny snippet of the human genome. We encode uh, in the computer uh, the letters of DNA as these A's, T's, C's, and G's, each of which represents a different little DNA molecule in a big string. And the total size of this in humans is about 3 billion of these little letters. So this is just a tiny, tiny chunk of a huge uh, bit of uh, packet of information. So our human genomes, about 3 billion of these base pairs that we call them long, these letters. Um, but before we feel too good about ourselves for having a really big genome, we should note that there's a plant called Paris japonica that has 150 billion base pairs in its genome. So just the size of your genome alone doesn't actually tell you much about an organism or its level of complexity. Sprinkled throughout our genomes are little units of information called genes, and these genes are what contain the instructions to make proteins, and those proteins then do all the work in our cells. But genes are actually only a tiny fraction of the genome, like one to two percent of all those three billion letters, and they're sort of sprinkled throughout in these little chunks. Humans have about 20,000 of these genes, but again, before we feel too cocky, water fleas have 30,000 genes. So again, just your total number of genes doesn't tell you much about the organism. It's more about how, what they do and how they interact. Because we're all part of this big and beautiful branching evolutionary tree, we actually share a lot of our genetic material with other uh, species that may be closely related or actually more distantly related. This is a diagram, it's a little dramatic from 23andMe, the company, um, but it's showing sort of how much of our genes we share with our evolutionary relatives. So, you know, humans and chimp are close evolutionary relatives, so we share a lot of genetic material, but even as you get all the way out to plants, we're still actually sharing quite a bit uh, of our genes. There are genes that carry out functions in plants that carry out kind of similar functions in us. And by looking at this shared genetic history, you can actually learn a lot about what makes particular species sort of special or how they've adapted to their own environment. I kind of like to think of the process of, of looking at a genome as walking through this huge, beautiful library, but when you pull a book down, it looks like total gibberish. And it's the job of us as genomicists to try to pull out the parts of the text that actually contain information and see in this whole sea of three billion letters where there is relevant information that we can learn from. So this is what I set out to do for sea otters. Um, I started with a DNA sample from an otter named Gidget who lived at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and I sequenced, assembled, and annotated her genome. Like humans, the sea otter genome is about three billion of those DNA letters long. So what does this actually entail? Well, I started with a blood sample from Gidget that was taken during a routine medical exam. I extracted the DNA that was in her blood. I chopped it up, sheared it into pieces that are about 150 of those letters long. So taking something that's three billion letters long and chopping it up into 150 letter pieces. We then put it on a sequencing machine that sequence each of, uh, sequences each of these fragments over and over and over again, massively in parallel. So each of these little fragments gets read over and over to try to correct for any sort of errors in the reading. 
Then there's a huge computational task where it takes hundreds of supercomputers all linked together, working for many weeks at a time to actually try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and figure out the right order for all these little fragments that have been sequenced. Once they give me that sequence, I then need to actually find those relevant pieces of information, those genes scattered around the genome. And so I used computational models to try to find the genes that encode proteins, largely based on um, similarity to other species. So you can leverage information that we have from, say, um, cats or ferrets or humans or mice to try to find those uh, genes in the sea otter genome. After years of work, uh, this is all done. And what's great is this is now a resource that any of us can uh, use or explore. If you go to the uh, UC Santa Cruz website, there is a genome browser where you can actually go explore Gidget's genome, um, as well as the genomes of many other species that you might be interested in, like an alpaca or a monk seal. Um, and so I think it's wonderful that this is now just like a publicly available resource for anyone. So now that we had the genome, the first thing I wanted to look for were those signals of sea otter's recent marine adaptation. So uh, you remember I showed you this picture of all their incredible things they've evolved to be able to survive in the marine realm, and we wanted to know if we could detect changes in any genes that might relate to these adaptations. The way we did that is taking advantage of the evolutionary tree and comparing sea otter genes to genes of many other related species. So here their closest relative in the tree is a giant otter, that's a freshwater otter, and then a domestic ferret, but then all the way out to further uh, more distantly related species like dogs or cats or pangolins. What we found is a few really interesting signals of sea otter adaptation. We detected some genes that have changes under what we call strong positive selection, meaning they were probably really beneficial for sea otters during their evolution. And these genes are related to bone density, brain development, reproduction, and immune function. We were particularly struck by these bone density genes because as I'd showed you with this picture before, we know that sea otters have these incredibly dense bones that let them dive deep and act as their divers weight belts. And so we think we've actually found the changes in two particular genes that might underlie this increased bone mineralization in sea otters. We, of course, really wanted to know if we could find the genes related to their incredible fur. And what we found is not one or two genes with big changes that might uh, cause sea otters to have evolved this amazing fur, but we actually found a suite of genes, many genes, with very small changes that seem to be maybe working together to create this amazing fur. So it's not like one big smoking gun of like, this is the gene that does it, but it's actually probably a pretty complex trait controlled by many different factors in the genome, which is pretty exciting. Finally, we were also interested not just in what sea otters had gained in their evolution to the marine realm, but also what they're losing. We know um, marine mammals like dolphins, which have been marine mammals for a very long time, right, like 55 million years, um, that they have basically lost their sense of smell. They don't need to smell underwater. It's not useful to them. And so there's hundreds of genes that enable the sense of smell, and dolphins have basically lost them all. Sea otters, on the other hand, you know, there are more recent marine mammal species. Their terrestrial relatives are, have really good sense of smell and a lot of these olfactory genes. So we wondered whether they were starting to lose that process and if we could detect that signal. What we found is that sea otters have lost hundreds of these scent related genes, but they still also retain quite a lot of them. So they are truly intermediate between something terrestrial and something really extremely marine, like a dolphin or a seal. And it feels like we've just actually caught sort of a little snapshot of them in the midst of their evolution to the marine realm. And maybe if we checked back in on them in 20 or 30 million years, they might have lost a lot more of this ability. Um, but at least for now, it seems like it's very intermediate and sort of in the process of losing this set of genes. So that was some of the things that we learned about the sea otters just based on one genome and trying to understand their evolution. But what we really wanted to do was try to detect the impacts of the fur trade. And that, um, for that, we needed more than one genome. So we actually gathered genetic samples uh, from researchers all around the sea otters range from the Curl Islands, north of Japan, the Commander Islands, Aleutian Islands, central Alaska, and California with at least seven individuals sampled from each of those locations. 
And the reason we want lots of these genomes is that by putting these genomes together, we can actually start to reconstruct the population history. So these data enabled a wide array of analyses. We actually made the cover of molecular ecology with um, all the, the cool stuff we did. And I'm gonna tell you about some of this today. So the first analysis we wanted to do is inspired by research on humans. So this is human data. This is a very famous result uh, from 2008 uh, where researchers sequenced genomes of people in Europe. And what they found in this plot is if you plot people by their genetic similarity, so points that are closer together are more genetically similar to each other, points that are farther away are more genetically distant, what you can kind of see if you tilt your head and squint is that the genetic similarity map here almost perfectly recapitulates the map of Europe, where you know people from Spain are more closely related to people from Spain, people from France, to people from France, and it actually all kind of spaces out in such a way that looks kind of like the map of Europe, indicating that human genetic differentiation in Europe actually reflects the geography and borders of that region. And so we wondered what this might look like for sea otters. So here's our version of this plot. Each point here is a sea otter, um, and they're colored by where they're from uh, in terms of the sample, but the clustering is all based on genetics. So if two points are closer together, they're more genetically similar. And what we found is that sea otters form these distinctive groups. And if you look at the map, it actually really matches the geography and sort of distance and spacing of these populations um, in, in real uh, spatial, in the spatial sense. And so here, this genetic differentiation is again reflecting the geography, just like in human populations. Um, when you add California to this analysis, it actually kind of squishes everything off to the side because it is so distinct and different uh, from all these other sea otter populations. So the southern sea otters in California are really a very sort of distinct genetic lineage that's quite different uh, compared to all the northern and Asian sea otters. We also used an analysis called TreeMix to infer whether there'd been any sort of genetic connectivity between sea otter populations in the past. And what we found is that, yes, there seems to be a history of genetic material flowing in both directions, sort of along these northern island chains, likely when sea otters were very abundant. And this doesn't mean that a sea otter was swimming from Japan to Alaska, but it means that it might swim to a neighboring population in its lifetime and breed and pass on its genetic material. And then maybe one of its descendants goes a little further and further and so on. And sort of along these island chains, you might over many generations get some of what we call gene flow moving back and forth. But what we were really interested in is the fur trade, right? This incredible bottleneck that happened for sea otter populations. So a bottleneck is when a population rapidly decreases in size. We call it that because it kind of looks like a wine bottle on its side. And bottlenecks can have a lot of really harmful impacts. They can reduce genetic diversity, they can increase the frequency of harmful genetic variants in the population, and they can lead to inbreeding. So it's not good to go through a bottleneck, and if you're in one, you want to get out of it as, as quickly as possible. So we can actually use these sea otter genomes we sampled from the present day to learn about their ancestors and their past, because all genomes carry the history of population size changes kind of hidden inside them. And so by sequencing genomes of modern sea otters, we can learn about their ancestors. And this is work I did with a fantastic undergraduate who's at UCLA, now getting their PhD, Pune Kalori. So we were able to infer a model where we could infer the uh, effective size of sea otter populations prior to the fur trade and then during the fur trade, and then look at this across all the populations uh, that we had genetic material from. What we found is a really similar picture across the entire range of a population that was sort of larger and more robust crashing with only about 2 to 13% of individuals surviving. And this is really just sort of stunning for us to see it, even though we sort of knew from the historical records how hard hit sea otter populations were, but to see that there's these sort of scars left um, in the genetic material that we can really pick up just ex how extreme this event was and the fact that no remnant population was spared. Um, so this was quite a, a remarkable finding to be able to pick up something so recent uh, from the genetic material. We wondered what impacts this event might have for sea otters genetic future as I mentioned bottlenecks can have a lot of harmful consequences. 
And so we use genetic simulations to actually try to predict the impacts of the fur trade on sea otter uh, genetics and health. Uh, what we found is that the sea otter, uh, the fur trade would likely did reduce sort of sea otter fitness by increasing the frequency of harmful genetic variants. This is a quantity we call genetic load. So high genetic load isn't a good thing. So what we see in our simulations is that during the fur trade, this load probably shot up for sea otters around the time of this dashed line. And then if we allow them to sort of recover for a really long time, they still can't get rid of this genetic load. It'll sort of very slowly erode, even at a bigger population size, but they could potentially be stuck with it for many hundreds of generations. Uh, so it's quite possible that every sea otter population now is a bit less fit than they used to be before the fur trade. However, in good news, we teamed up with Chris Kiriazis, who did some really interesting uh, additional simulations to see whether this genetic load could actually doom sea otters to extinction due to genetic factors. And what he found is no. Even though this load is elevated compared to what it used to be, it's not so extreme that it would actually just cause sea otters to spiral into extinction from genetic factors. We still have to worry about all those other threats I mentioned, things like habitat density and um, predation, but their genetics isn't going to uh, drive them extinct, which is really reassuring. We also did some models of potential types of uh, translocations or restorations of sea otter populations. And one thing that would reduce this genetic load much more quickly, according to our simulations, is if you mixed sea otter populations together, um, because they could actually sort of balance out each other's harmful variants and actually be more robust and get rid of this uh, genetic load more quickly. So that's sort of interesting to think about if you think about sort of strategies for sea otters in the future. Another thing we were interested in is whether sea otters in California uh, before the fur trade are genetically similar to the ones that are surviving there today. So we teamed up with some wonderful archaeologists and we got some ancient DNA out of sea otter teeth. When you're working with ancient DNA, you have to be really careful to avoid modern contamination. So here I am all space suited up in a dedicated clean room to try to get this DNA out of these teeth. And what we found is that the ancient California sea otters cluster with modern California sea otters, meaning that they're very genetically similar. Uh, the otters that lived about you know 1200 years ago in California and the ones that are there today, there wasn't any big genetic turnover that happened. Um, and so that's kind of reassuring that there's this continuity between uh, the, the ancient and the modern uh, southern sea otters in California. So I've been talking pretty much exclusively about uh, sea otters that are the descendants of otters that survived the fur trade, but what about lost sea otter populations where they were completely wiped out? And this is this really poignant logo from the uh, organization Sea Otter Savvy, showing that we were here, sea otters used to be along so much of the coastline where they aren't anymore. And so just a reminder of sort of where those regions are, there were these sort of big missing links uh, from Alaska down to Northern California, and then from Southern California down to Mexico. Uh, in the 70s, researchers carried out translocations to try to fill in some of these missing links. So they took otters from the Aleutian Islands and Prince William Sound and moved them down the coast. They also took otters from Monterey and moved them down to San Nicolas Island in Southern California. And there was also a, a translocation to Oregon that ultimately failed, and the Alaka Alliance website has a lot of really interesting information about that. Um, but there's a lot we don't know about these lost populations because they don't have any survivors alive today for us to study. So we don't know whether sea otters in Washington and Oregon were genetically more similar to sea otters in California or sea otters in Alaska, or were they somehow genetically intermediate? Was this one big gradient of genetics from Alaska all the way down to Mexico? In Mexico, similarly, we don't know whether those sea otters were very uh, similar and connected to otters in California, or was there again some sort of uh, break where they were a really distinct uh, population? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about some research. This is all very much ongoing and we don't really know the answers to this, but I can tell you a little bit also about some of my work uh, about the otters in Mexico, what I like to call the mystery of the Baja California sea otters. Um, so we know that sea otters were likely wiped out from this region. Um, by the fur trade. And yet in recent years, uh, fishermen and researchers are starting to spot sea otters in Baja. And so this prompted this huge question as to whether these could actually be survivors of the lost Baja population. Did they actually not get wiped out? 
or are sea otters from California actually taking it upon themselves to move down into Mexico under their own steam? Uh, probably from somewhere around the San Nicolas Island colony where they were translocated. So to solve this mystery, we teamed up with a fantastic set of researchers in Mexico, Dr. Gisela Heckel, Yolanda Schramm, Sergio Nigana Morales, and Andres Moreno Estrada, to try to answer this question using genomics. So we sequenced the genomes of two uh, sea otters that had been sampled in Baja by Gisela and Yolanda. And what Sergio found with the analyses is that using um, a number of different analyses that these sea otters sampled in Baja were genetically indistinguishable from those from California. And so what this indicates is it's likely that sea otters from California are naturally recolonizing Baja rather than this being a distinct uh, original sort of lost Baja population. Um, this is still really exciting because it could help restore this missing link in these ecosystem services of sea otters in Baja. But it sadly doesn't tell us, you know, what the original Baja sea otters were like genetically. We would need some sort of ancient DNA to learn more about that. But um, it is still really interesting that these sea otters might be moving down there. Um, and then maybe over the long term, maybe with some cooperation between the US and Mexican governments, maybe they could actually become a, a real sustainable colony down there, which would be really amazing. But what about those lost populations in Oregon and Washington? What were they like? So this is some of my research using, again, modern sea otters from the sort of upper and lower ends of this part of the sea otter range. So I had samples from Alaska and samples from California, but nothing in between where there are no survivors. But we were able to at least infer the history of these two populations at the ends of the range, finding that the sea otters in Alaska and those in California split some 28,000 years ago. So that's around the time of the last glacial maximum. So this coastline would have been really covered in ice and glaciers. So it sort of makes sense that that might have driven some separation between northern and southern sea otters. But what this doesn't tell us is what anything about what was happening to those lost populations that were in between these two ends of the range. And that's where ancient DNA is starting to fill in some of the gaps. And this is um, not my research, but I, I know some of the researchers involved, they're fantastic. Um, they're using ancient DNA uh, from uh, these sea otter uh, populations that predated the fur trade to fill in gaps of our knowledge. And so one ancient DNA study from 2008 found that uh, sea otters in sort of the Washington, Oregon area were maybe genetically a bit more Alaska, or excuse me, more California-like. But then a later study says, oh, no, it seems like they're actually a bit more Alaska-like. So there's sort of still some contradictory findings in this region. And so we really need more samples and more ancient genomes to really drill down in and figure this out. Um, and I have a lot of confidence in, in the researchers working on this that as ancient DNA sequencing gets even better and the technology gets even better, I suspect this will be a question that does get answered. And so it's fun to sort of stay tuned and be on the edge of our seats, wondering what these otters were, were like genetically. And one reason a lot of people wanna know this is if you were going to try to restore otters along this part of the coastline, where should they come from? Should you bring them down from Alaska or up from California? What would best sort of mirror the, um, original sort of genetic profile of the otters that used to be here and is that even possible and so that's why this is sort of a really interesting and ongoing question so just to wrap up here what we've talked about um, sea otters are evolutionary newcomers to the marine realm and we could detect changes in their genome that reflects this Sea otter remnant populations are genetically uh, distinct but they do have a history of genetic interconnection probably prior to the fur trade uh, sea otter genomics allowed us to estimate just how severe the fur trade was for sea otter populations all the way from Japan to California. It was a really catastrophic event that still has a signal we can see today. Um, and sea otters from California appear to be recolonizing Baja, restoring a missing link all on their own. Finally, we still don't know for sure what sea otters were like in those lost populations genetically, but ancient, ancient DNA is starting to provide some answers, and that's a really exciting area of research. I just wanted to point out that we've actually been applying similar methods to what we did for the sea otters to other marine mammals. So my colleagues Sergio and Meishi uh, did the same sort of demographic modeling we did for the sea otters for fin whales, and they were actually able to detect the signal of whaling in fin whale genomes in much the same way we detected the signal of the fur trade uh, for sea otters. 
And then my colleagues Jacqueline and Chris uh, used genome sequencing to try to determine if the vaquita porpoise, which is the most endangered marine mammal in the world, there's about 12 of them left, whether it's genetically doomed to extinction due to its population bottleneck. And so using some of these simulation based methods I was talking about. So I really love seeing that sort of things that we think about for the sea otter can also be applied more broadly to other species that have been really badly impacted by humans as well. So with that, I want to wrap up. I really want to thank the Alaka Alliance for throwing this incredible event and inviting me, particularly Chanel and Bob. This is just absolutely wonderful. And then big studies like this with sea otters from Japan to Mexico don't just happen in isolation. I've been so lucky to work with amazing co-authors, collaborators, sample collectors, funders, and advisors to make this happen. And I'm so grateful and want to acknowledge all of their contributions. So with that, uh, I want to say thank you and ask uh, if you have any questions for me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Annabelle. That was super fascinating. Thanks, you know. Um, okay. I do have a question for you. Um, Beth asks, if all the California otters are from that one small population, I believe it was a couple dozen, um, is there is inbreeding an issue with the southern sea otters? Great question. Yeah, I think um, one positive thing is that because these bottlenecks were fairly short uh, for all the sea otter populations, they got out of them pretty quickly. Um, there's less impact of inbreeding than if they had stayed really small for a really long time, where they sort of have no choice but to inbreed. Um, but we did find that levels of inbreeding were sort of elevated in sea otter um, compared to some other species. And I think there's some work going on now at UC Santa Cruz to try to quantify inbreeding across the sea otter range and, and dig into that a bit more. We did sort of find that just all the sea otters we sampled in California were sort of all kind of background slightly related to each other. So I think there probably is at least some level of inbreeding going on. Okay, thank you. Um, Wendy asks, can you please tell us again how your findings can inform reintroduction efforts? For sure, yeah. So I think um, the stuff that I particularly study is maybe less relevant for the reintroductions, say in Oregon, I think, than those ancient DNA studies I mentioned by Valentine and Wellman um, are going to be more useful for this part of the coastline. Um, but I do think the simulations we did are, are kind of useful to think about when we're thinking about reintroductions, um, because, you know, if it's bad for sea otters to have this elevated genetic load, um, it's maybe worth thinking about mixing sea otters from two different locations when you translocate them to try to balance that load out and offload it more quickly. And, you know, the translocations in the 70s did not really use DNA, but the fact that they mixed otters from Prince William Sound and the Aleutian Islands was probably a really good idea because they could sort of mask each other's genetic load. And so thinking about those sorts of strategies moving forward, I think is really valuable to sort of think about that genetic variation. Awesome. I think that kind of goes along with the next question. Patricia asks, would mixing the Alaskan and California populations increase genetic diversity? Yeah, great question. So um, those were very specific simulations we did because we were interested in that question. And it certainly seemed like that would have really dramatic uh, effects of, of lowering load, potentially depending on how you do it. But I do think there's like a lot of legislative and policy hurdles to that. I think because they're managed as sort of different subspecies, um, you can't do that easily. You could imagine though a natural scenario, right? Where otters from Alaska have been translocated and are you know, as far south say as Northern Washington and the ones from California might start moving up. So just like those ones in Mexico who have taken it upon themselves to go south, we could imagine maybe over hundreds of years, some natural mixing starting to happen um, uh, under sea otter's own steam. Yeah, that Crystal asked, are Southern and Northern subspecies able to interbreed? So I think you just answered that as a yes. <laughs> I believe so. I don't know if anyone's tried, honestly, but I they aren't so different or so diverge. Only 28,000 years, which is, I mean, it sounds like a long time to us, but it's not actually that long. I, I suspect they'd be, be okay interbreeding. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I was going to say uh, Dr. Sean Larson from the Seattle Aquarium, I know, is doing a lot of work on 
the genetic differences or actually similarities between the two subspecies that I think will be published soon. Um, let's see, Anna asks, is there any recoverable DNA in samples from hunted otters during the fur trade from, can you get it from their pelts or their teeth like you showed that you did your DNA extraction from? Great question. I originally, when I started this project, I thought we'd be able to get so much from pelts because I thought, oh my gosh, they've killed all these otters and we can when get stuff. But it turns out the way pelts are treated almost entirely destroys the DNA. I think there are now newer techniques like the Shapiro lab in UC Santa Cruz is figuring out how to get DNA out of materials that have been, you know, really heated or, or tanned or treated. Um, but at least for my project, the reason we're using the teeth is there was more DNA preserved in the tooth root. Um, another thing to think about is temperature. So DNA does not like being hot. Um, and so you get much better ancient DNA from the far north. It's why some of the, you know, best ancient DNA studies have been from samples in like the permafrost of like mammoths and things like that. Um, so that was one reason, like we haven't yet gotten any good ancient DNA out of say Baja, where it's pretty warm um, and, and the DNA is not so happy, but these technologies just keep getting better and better. So that's why I'm, I'm sort of optimistic that more ancient DNA will come. Great, well, we've got more questions for you. Um, Jane asks, there are, or are there losses to genetic mixing between Southern and Northern sea otters? Should we worry about losing distinction between the two subspecies? Great question. Yeah, this is something we think about a lot. And I think people who wouldn't be in favor of mixing would have a very good point, which is that, you know, I showed just how genetically distinct the Southern sea otters are. And perhaps they do have local adaptations or things that make them sort of special. And I do think it makes sense to manage that population um, maybe a little more closely that they are just sort of the last remnant of that region of, of sea otter genetic diversity. And so if you, you know, just took a bunch of otters from Alaska and dumped them in California, you might totally lose whatever that sort of secret sauces for for southern california uh southern sea otters in california so i think i agree that we wouldn't just want to willy-nilly um dilute that genetic profile on the other hand i do think it's likely that when sea otters were abundant it probably was like a big genetic gradient and california is just kind of the end point but because we've lost everybody in between it makes california more distinct but maybe if we had all the otters from that whole range it would just be that california is sort of the end of that genetic gradient. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, I think Bob was asking, so we know sometimes we get some um, lone male sea otters, mostly from the Washington population that come down south into Oregon, um, looking for a raft of beautiful female sea otters, and unfortunately we don't have any. Uh, so relating that to the sea otters in Baja, do you think, uh, personally that they're trying to start a population down there, or maybe they're just curious males on the move looking for more females? What are your kind of thoughts around that? That's such a great question. One reason we were so surprised about some of the findings in Baja is that one of the otters is a female. Um, and so had they all been male, we that's sort of within the realm of possibility that, oh, otters, you know, male otters travel a lot, but females tend to not travel very much from from you know their sort of home range and so that was very surprising and that was one reason people thought it was possible that they were survivors of the lost population the genetic sort of says no um, but i do wonder how she got down there did she get caught in a current was she just very adventurous i'm i'm not sure but um at least we had one male and one female so um somehow a female's getting down there ah i didn't know that awesome um okay Andrew asks, what's the role of gene expression, e.g. in response to environmental con conditions in local and regional sea otter populations and improving genetic fitness? Oh, super interesting. So I think there's some work, I believe it's like Liz Bowen doing some gene expression work in sea otters in response to things like toxoplasmosis or stress exposures, um, I think even fire exposures. Um, so yeah, gene expression for, for those who maybe don't do as much genomics is that, you know, we have all these genes in our genome, but not all of them are being turned on all the time. And the actual profile of what genes get turned on when can actually tell us a lot about stress or disease status or reproduction and all these different sort of things that a, a species might go through. Um, 
So I only did pretty limited um, expression work. I, I used gene expression information to annotate the sea otter genome, but um, didn't do much beyond that, excuse me, to compare or contrast uh, sea otter populations. Um, but that is really interesting to think about sort of the longer term expression impacts uh, that the fur trade, fur trade might have had. Great question. Uh, Esther chimed in. I think they missed a little bit of the beginning of your presentation, but um, they asked if you um, shared the original numbers of otter populations along the West Coast before the maritime fur trade. Oh, great question. Yeah. So, I mean, I think sort of estimates um, from historical records and so on is, you know, otters in sort of across the range in each of these locations, there were sort of tens of thousands. I don't know particular numbers, say, for Oregon specifically. Um, certainly our genetic inference, um, there's sort of a, it's a bit in the weeds, but like we sort of estimate a genetic population size because, right, because not every otter is going to reproduce of those 10,000. And so there's kind of a, a big population number, say maybe 10,000, and then sort of what core of that is actually really contributing genetic material that goes forward. And that was sort of in the three to 5,000 range for each of the populations we looked at. Um, and that sort of would scale up pretty nicely to about 10,000 actual otters. If you could have counted them, maybe about half of those are actually like contributing genetic material. So I would imagine that would probably be pretty similar in Washington and Oregon. Um, it seems like California at least may have had multiple bottlenecks even prior to the fur trade. They might have declined and then come back before. So that could have happened in Washington, Oregon as well. But since we don't have the enough genetic samples, we, we don't know. Thank you. Um, Beth asks, do you use Berkeley's home program for the public to, to help compile the data, the platform that SETI oh. uses? Uh, no, I don't think I'm, I'm not familiar with Berkeley's uh, one. Um, I did show that um, the sea otter genome is now available on the UC Santa Cruz genome browser. So you can go look at it there. But I actually use um, a, a different suite of programs uh, for all the assembly stuff. Um, but that sounds like a cool one. I'll have to look into it. Okay, is there any more last minute questions anyone has? Uh, we've got lots of Great compliments on your presentation in the chat. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, let's see, I'm just checking. I, I published the UC Santa Cruz website to find that genome on the chat. So be sure to check that out. Uh, I'll also put it in the YouTube um, once this gets published for people to click as well. Uh, well, with that, it's 9.56. So we're sparing four minutes until our next presenter. So. Thank you, um, Annabelle, for joining us today. If you have any last thoughts or remarks you want to share with anyone, please do. I just want to thank you all. These were fantastic questions, and I'm just seeing all the lovely compliments in the chat. So thank you. This was a really a, a huge pleasure. Thank you, Chanel and Bob and everyone else. Bye-bye. Yeah, wonderful.